Once again, uh, good morning everybody. Um, welcome to the second day of the second CCP conference. First, uh, before starting, I would like to ask the audience a warm welcome and an applause for Yola, since she's doing absolutely outstanding work. And regarding the number of the people in the audience, it's not the quantity that counts, but it's the quality that counts. So at that point, we are ready. Um, my co-chair is Milan, who will uh, tell us a very impressive story, and I would like to have my first slide. I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is that we know that colorectal cancer is preventable, is treatable, and is treatable. We heard it by Barbara, we were here today, we will hear from uh, Milan and other people in the audience to know this. It's preventable, treatable, and treatable. The bad news is that during this two-day meeting, colorectal cancer killed 1,060 Europeans. I saw a newspaper this morning, I didn't saw anything about it. Since the definition of news is, news is what happens today and not what happens every day. Every day, colorectal cancer kills more than 500 people in Europe, and that's too much. Colorectal cancer is a silent killer, and if you don't win the enemy, you can't win the war. So we have to know the disease. The colon is probably not the most attractive organ, I agree with you. It's not that bad, that's nice. But if you look at it in a more positive way, then you say, well, that's a nice organ, let's take care of it. Colon cancer is 95% curable if early detected. That's a simple message. That should people know. But if you look anywhere in the world, and this is from a study from McKinsey in five different parts of the world, then we unfortunately see that still nearly 50% of the cases are still found in late advanced disease stage 3 and stage 4. And we have to change this. I think there is a problem. There is a lack of knowledge of early detection of colorectal cancer in the general population, also by the general physicians and by the specialists. And I have to add also by the journalists. I don't know if there is any journalist in the audience, but they should write about it, they should speak about it, and also by the politicians. By the way, where are the politicians? We must stop colorectal cancer. That's our only mission. We must stop this disease. And in the next session, we will speak how we can try to do this. We will listen to an awareness campaign in France. We will see how we can prevent colorectal cancer in men. Milan will focus on a very nice and impressive Matilda story. And I will try to answer the question where or when to begin colorectal cancer prevention. I would like to ask the first speaker on the floor. Professor Dennis Herzbach, and he will speak about the awareness campaign in France. So, good morning. Many thanks to the organizer to invite me for this lecture. So, it's very difficult to speak about uh, awareness in Europe because uh, preventive uh, and screening. Uh, program is very different across countries. So I choose to explain you and to expose how it works in France. Colorectal cancer screening in France began in 2002 and the first pilot study was made in Burgundy at this time with the national extension of screening during 2007 and 2009. During this screening program there is a Three, three tools to explain and to a rare uh, population about this screening. First one was uh, TV information, second one, one was a uh, national and private health and endoscopy establishment who performed some one day information during uh, each year. And finally, more recently, the French Society of uh, Endoscopy planned a column tool with a, which is a specific tool. The current tool is a specific tool for public meeting outside private or public hospital. It's a kind of giant latex column and the meeting takes place 
in a different part of uh, each town as uh, in supermarket or shopping malls. This is a picture of the giant uh, latex uh, column and you can cross this, uh, this column and uh, to look and touch some uh, macroscopic lesion as a uh, polyp here. So the current tour program began in 2010 and the first appointment and meeting took place <coughs> and in Paris during 2010. Now there is a, a geographic organization of different meetings with this tool and there is uh, some uh, uh, financial partner with a budget of uh, about 25 to uh, 30,000 euro per year. So during this time and during this current meeting, screening program takes place in France and the first evaluation was performed in 2000, 2011 and uh, as you could see, in total across the the country there is a participation rate of only 34 percent with a small difference between men and, and women. So the result of this screening program was pretty good because there is a positive rate of 2.8 percent, a colonoscopy rate in positive FOBT of 88 percent a low colonoscopy morbidity and finally there is a standardized detection rate of adenoma up to 7 to 3 percent and for carcinoma up to uh, 2.6 to 1.2 percent. However, despite a good participation rate during 2011 there is still in France as high as uh, 40,000 uh, 40, new colorectal cancer and up to uh, 17,000 deaths due to this cancer. So, if, if we do a, par a parallel between awareness and effectiveness, we, we could see that uh, despite a lot of current tour number uh, across different parts of France, the participation rate to the FOBT uh, screening program was uh, uh, good but not uh, high in each part. Moreover, there is uh, some inquiry in France about number of colonoscopy. On this uh, slide, you can see that uh, since 2001, there is about 1 million of colonoscopy per year in France. Among this colonoscopy, about, about 20 to 30 percent were performed for screening, and uh, among them, about 10 to uh, 18 percent were performed after positive FOBT. So, we can conclude that before 2007, date of CRC screening program extension across country uh, up to uh, 30, uh, 27 to uh, 33 uh, percent of colonoscopy were done for screening program. And among them, about half were performed for positive FOB. So, in 2012, five years after national extension of FOBT screening program, the participation rate to this program was low because it was only 34 uh, percent, and uh, to be uh, efficacy, it must uh, go to 45 uh, percent. When we compare uh, what happens. At the beginning of the program and at the end of the program, we could conclude that uh, there is a possi possible impact of a campaign with general practitioner or national information on TV because uh, percentage, percentage of colonoscopy performed for screening increase, but uh, most of them increase 
for a positive FOBT. More recently about the colon tour and uh, giant colon, uh, giant latex colon, we cannot do a firm conclusion because we do not have so firm data. And I think that, uh, so despite some effectiveness of awareness should be observed, there is still, there is not still associated to VKC on a, a decrease of CLC test. So, we move directly to the question. Yeah, okay. First question. Do you think that a rareness com Oops. Oops. That's the same. That's the same one. That's the same one. Ah, okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, do you think that a rareness campaign has the main key of an effective CLC screening program? Yes or no? after the question. Okay. Okay. So one, what is the best indicator for success of awareness campaign? A decrease in incidence and reduction of a COC mortality. I think the last one, let's take the last one, I think that yeah. uh, all depends about the, the financial incentive, how large it will ah. be. Oh. If the people will be offered uh, 1,000 euros, then you will have a completely different uh, response. But um, I think there are some studies done, the, study, the pilot study that was done in, uh, in our country, that uh, in, like a new invitation that can help and you can also play with the phrases in the lab. It's very interesting how you can augment the participation rate. But um, telephone call, the people are not at home, and it's uh, going to be difficult. But okay, I agree that this is quite uh, different responses to one question. So, any comments for me? Hmm? Any questions to our speaker? Thanks very much. Uh, Ian Banks from the European Men's Health Forum, Brussels. Thank you very much for the presentation. I find it fascinating because I'll be speaking next about how we can get men to be involved. And your figures for men 
compared to women are more or less the same across Europe. In fact, it's better than some, some parts of Europe. I, d I do wonder whether your question with regard to what is the best um, measure of success was a, a bit confused in that if it was a measure of success for awareness for people to take part in a, in a, a cancer screening program, it would be a reduction in mortality. But if it was a general awareness campaign, obviously we would want a lowering of the incidence of, of the cancer. So maybe that's not as clear cut as it, as it sounds. It would be interesting to hear from you afterwards, we could chat, what your thoughts are in terms of have we actually reached the, the most at risk group people and therefore that is why we are not seeing the reduction in mortality. In other words, are the most at risk people least likely to take part in the, in the, in the screening program and so therefore we're not seeing a decline because of, because of that. And that's certainly what we saw with cervical cancer across Europe, that the most at risk women were the least likely to take part in the cervical cancer and yet despite that we are actually seeing a, a decrease in, in cervical cancer but it might be part of the reason. Yeah, I agree. But in France we have no, no, no choice to, to use a different kind of screening program. We, we need to, we are required to use only a GAIAC FOBD at, at this moment. And I think it's the kind of problem. It's yeah. better when you can aware different people and offer different tools to screen as a, a blood test, a fecal test, or colonoscopy. I yeah. think that some people are aware of the CRC, but uh, are maybe some reluctant to, to do one, one test because uh, if there is a good education, they say, oh, I, don't, I don't want to, to perform fecal test, I want a colonoscopy. And yeah. as a doctor, we say, well, yeah, but the colonoscopy is not, a, is not indicated for screening at the first line. Yeah. It's very difficult to, to discuss about that. Yeah. I want to comment on the, the second question. Uh, if you say that what's the best indicator to, to measure the success of the awareness campaign, if we have to wait for to measure the incidence of uh, colon cancer or the reduction in mortality, then we have we need a period of five or ten years. So yeah. I think another indicator would be the participation rate. Yeah, yeah. That's something you can measure within half a year if a campaign is yeah. capable. Increasing the participation rate. I think yeah. that's all about it. Yeah. Yes, but on, a, on an economic point of view, the financial part of our want to see a decrease of mortality. Yes, but I think we should uh, now, with all the data that we have, we should be able to uh, convince them that it's uh, from an economic point of view, it's uh, something that's uh, is cost saving. Mm. Mm.
long time to wait. Yeah. <laughs> so another problem with the incidence rate, um, probably in the first round you will pick up more new tumors than in your second and your third round. So using only the incidence rate as a marker for success of your awareness campaign can be a little bit tricky. And in France, uh, Colanto, there is another problem in France because uh, Colanto uh, was organized in different towns where people are very involved in uh, CRC uh, detection, prevention, and usually it's in the same administrative district where the participation rate for the screening pro program is higher. So it's very difficult. Ideally, we need to use this tool in a in country or in town where the participation is very low. Okay, well done. We have just one second left. Excellent work. Could, uh, um, I have one more question. Could, could the trend be an indicator? Not the actual numbers, but the trend. I mean, if in previous years, before the screen, the trend was 10% decrease every year. And after the screening, the trend, although the years are, the numbers are increasing, but the trend is a little bit yes, lower. Yes. Could that be an indicator? Should be, yes. Mm -hmm. Last question from the floor. I'll go over to the next speaker. We all know that uh, men and women are quite different, so also in the family of colorectal cancer. The IMS will address us and we'll speak about preventing colorectal cancer in men. Thank you very much. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Uh, thank you very much. Can I thank Johanna very much indeed for the invitation to speak in the organization committee. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to, to be here because it follows on so beautifully from the last presentation with regard to the differences between men and women. Um, it does strike me Yola, that if 1,060 people died during this conference. If we'd cancelled the conference, we could have saved over a thousand lives if we cancelled the conference. <laughs> anyway, we're going to go through this very, very quickly. We're going to do this very, that's not statistically viable. Though. And we're going to go through this really quickly because I want to pick up on some of the points that were made earlier with regard to the differences. Now, <clears throat> this is, the, I'm sure you recognize this as the sun we don't have this in Ireland. It, it's, it's something we don't see very often. But, but if you see this thing here, this is Venus. And it's Venus traveling across the surface of the sun. And it happens about every 150 years or so. So if you miss this happening, don't worry. The life expectancy in Europe is going up so quickly, you'll probably be around in 100 years' time to be able to watch this again. Some of us won't be. But, but this thing happens really right forever as far as we're concerned. And people have been seeing it and not noticing anything about it. Until the 1700s, they sent a ship down, um, a sailing ship, with a clock and a, and a telescope into the southern hemisphere. So watch this happen. And in Greenwich, in England, in the northern hemisphere, they had another identical clock and a telescope to watch exactly the same thing happen. In the 1700s. And when they brought the two clocks together, they were different. The time it took for Venus to move across the surface of the sun, when measured in the southern hemisphere, was different than when measured in the northern hemisphere. And because of that difference, they could triangulate. They could work out the distance, the distance from the Earth to Venus, the Earth to the Sun, and the distance between every known planet in the solar system and Earth. It was the start of modern astronomy. In the 1700s they worked this out. They did it because somebody noticed a difference. And that's what I want to get across to you, is that simply noticing these differences can make an extraordinary difference when it comes to health and how we get messages across. And that's the message I want to get to you now. And we've started already because I've called it bowel cancer. There is still huge confusion over what kind of cancer you're talking about. We just take it for granted. 
You go out in the population and ask them what is bowel cancer, what is rectal cancer, what is colorectal cancer, what is stomach cancer, what is large bowel cancer, what is small bowel cancer. People just get confused. And this is why we need to be so careful about when we're talking about it, what is it we're actually talking about. Because people do get terribly confused over them. And this is one of the differences we have between men and women. Okay? This, is, this is well known. Women can multitask. They can drive a car. They can look in the mirror. They can do their makeup. They can hit the children behind and, and behind and thing. They can turn the radio on. A guy has to drive, and that's it. And he'll just about cope with having the radio on, and that's it. After that, everything falls to pieces, okay? Anybody screams in the back, it's all over. So this is us. Now, it's neither better or worse. It's just different, that's all. Men and women are equal. I will take no argument on this. We are equal, but we are different. And these differences can make a difference. This is one of the most profound statements I've ever heard from the pharmaceutical industry. This man, this man founded the modern, if you like, um, uh, pharmaceutical industry back in, 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 uh, in, in our last century, so to speak. And he gave away streptomycin, gave it away. He stopped the patents and just give it away to people. Essentially just give the drug away free. It was the only drug we had to treat um, uh, tuberculosis at the time and he gave it away. And he said basically that we should, profits should follow the health of people, not the other way around. And that is where we've got a problem at the moment. The economy is driving the health of people and it should be health driving the economy not the economy driving the health. And if we improve the health of our nations, we will improve the economy of our nations. And it's very hard to get that across to politicians. And by investing now in, in things like prevention of, of, of colorectal cancer and, and screening for early diagnosis, you will improve the economy. You will. And we know that it's not just a, a myth, it's the truth. And it's hard to get it across sometimes to, to, um, to, the, to the politicians. This was the report that came out from the European um, Commission. This is the response to it, looking at men's health across Europe. It gave us some very interesting results. This is the ratio of male to female cancer incidence now. And you can see that from almost every single cancer at every single age, men will develop cancer more often than women right across Europe. The exceptions to the rule are thyroid cancer and melanoma. And even in melanoma, more men will die from melanoma than will women, even though the incidence is higher in women. And there has to be a reason for this. And that's what we're going to look at very quickly. Because when you look at the death rate, more men die from cancer right across Europe than do women. More men actually die younger than women do all around the world. Women live longer than, than do men. And there are basically three reasons for why this could be true. The first one is that men are pre-programmed to drop dead early, like, like some kind of Mission Impossible tape. Should you, should you choose to accept the mission to be alive, you will drop dead at the age of 55, because that's what men do, drop dead early, okay? So there's number one, it's genetic. Can't do anything about it, we all go home. Number two is, it's where you live. It's the isolation, it's the use of the services, it's your income. These things influence your life expectancy. So it could be that one. It could be the third and the most obvious reason for why women live longer than men. And it's so simple, really. And that is that women kill men. Now, attractive as that theory is, and my wife's a great believer in this, attractive as that theory is, it's not true because married men live longer than unmarried men, but unmarried women live longer than married women. So if anything, men make women ill. And, and there's a message you can take home and all vote on it if you like. But the point about this is, of this particular slide, is that the ratio between the death rates across the countries of Europe changes. Do you see that? The ratio is not staying the same. And if it was only genetic, the ratio would stay the same in all the countries as you go across. It doesn't, it changes as you go across the countries. It cannot only be genetic. There may be a genetic component, but it's not just genetic, which means we can do something about this. We can change this situation. 
And of course, the death rate is higher in some countries than in others. Again, there has to be a reason. It can't be genetic. I refuse to believe that people in Lithuania are any different from people in Sweden when it comes to cancer. <clears throat> there has to be something else explaining this. It might be men's awareness of symptoms. Men are less likely to go to a doctor with, with a symptom than women are. They will wait longer with that symptom. And we've seen this. The only area that, it, that men excel is in swallowing, difficulty swallowing. Men are more likely to see a doctor than women. But any other symptom, men do not go and see the doctor as quickly. Why? Well, this could be part of the reason. When we asked women what would most put them off taking part in the colorectal screening program with fecal occult bloods, compared to men, when we asked them what would put them off, they said embarrassment. That was the most significant answer. When we asked men what would put them off taking part in the bowel cancer screening program, they said this. It was the fear of the diagnosis. This is the male brain speaking here. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't ask about it, because if you ask about it, you'll get it. So don't even ask, and then you'll never get it. And some male brain thinking here, like there's a manual. Don't look up the, the exhaust pipe, because there's nothing wrong with it. If you look up the exhaust pipe, something will go wrong with the exhaust pipe. If you've got something wrong with the tires, look up tires, and forget about the rest of it. This is the male brain speaking here, okay? So it could be that, or it could be this. Could be that that we're just stubborn, that we just we just won't do it. Maybe that's the reason why we dropped dead, drop dead early and we don't go. I don't believe that actually. I believe that it might be something else. I believe it's the way we deliver our services towards men. I think, for instance, if this guy has got an embarrassing problem, the first person he's going to have to speak to is a female receptionist in almost every family doctor surgery in Europe. He's going to have to talk to a female receptionist first. And she will ask him, why do you need to see a doctor? Not supposed to, but they do, because they want to make sure which way they're going to go. So they ask that question, and he thinks she lives right next to his mother. And when she goes home, she's going to say to his mother, your Johnny was in again with that drippy willy problem. I, I thought he got that sorted out years ago, you see. It's not true, but it doesn't matter. It's what's in his head that matters. I don't think we deliver our services quite as well as we do. A show of hands, please. How many of you in your family doctor surgery have got a male receptionist? A male receptionist, not, not a practice manager. One, two. Look around, okay? Now you can see the point I'm making. Maybe it's the way we're delivering our services. And this is the upshot. This is men's use of general practice. This is the UK, I apologize. But you can see here, look at the difference between women and men at this age group. Men aged 18 hardly go to see a doctor, not just because they're usually very well, but the reason why is they don't know how to make an appointment. Do you know why they don't know how to make an appointment? because their mothers always made the appointment for them. That's why they don't know. So when they leave home, they don't know how to make an appointment. They have no idea how to make an appointment. So they don't make an appointment. And there's a reason for that one. About here, men start to see the doctor the same as a woman. About the age of 60, about my age. Because something happens to a man around about the age of 60, and if I was to ask you, what is the definition of male middle age, it might be a clue. Does anybody know the definition of male middle age? It's when your prostate's bigger than your brain. That is around about 60, okay? And that's when we go and see the doctor, okay? But here is the, this is the a trauma. I'm a trauma doctor. This is when men come to see the emergency department in a hospital. Over the age of 50, there'll be twice as many admissions for men as women through the emergency department. That is the most expensive part of the health service. This is the most cost-effective part of the health service, okay? So, keep your men vertical. Don't let them go horizontal. This is what we did in terms of response to it. We formed a round table. 
where we looked at all of primary care in Europe, every single area, pharmacy, um, dentistry, optics, everything. And we looked at what were the barriers to men using their services. And the report that has come out of this is staggering of what they can see themselves of what are the barriers for men using their services. Because it's not the usual suspects who might pick up a cancer. A melanoma might not be picked up by a GP or a family doctor. It might be picked up by the pharmacist or a hairdresser. So I'm nearly finished now. Last slide coming up. Okay. This is the spaceship they sent to Mars. Okay. Men are from Mars. Here's Mars. And they sent a spaceship, and that spaceship was supposed to detect any life on Mars. They were supposed to go in orbit, but unfortunately, they were working in Earth in imperial units. The little spaceship was working in metric units. When they sent the signal out to go into orbit, it didn't understand, and it just whacked straight into Mars. You've got to give the information in a way that the person understands in their language and the way they think. So we produce information for men. It is specifically for men, and it directs it all towards men. And here we are, Chairman and I jumping for joy that you are now going to actually think about men's health more positively. And of course, there's been a bit of airbrushing going on here, but only in my case. And we should be able to go to questions. Thank you very much. Okay, do men and women act on health messages the same way? If you ask, if you scare the hell out of men, right, do you expect to see them outside the surgery the next day compared to women? Okay, you put a scare out okay, on television. Is there a cure of men outside the surgery or is there a cure of women? Okay, now then. So yes or no? Answer is? No. And you're absolutely right, and we've proven this. So why are we sending out the same information to both men and women, expecting it to work the same way? You would never do that with older people, younger people, children. You would always target. So why do we send the same information out? Next question, please. Do we listen to what men want to know? Not what we tell them that they need to know. Do we listen to what they want to know? Yes or no? I'm talking about the medical profession, health professionals generally. Do we listen? No, we don't. We've proven that also. In fact, if a man goes in to talk about sex and doesn't mention it, the chances of the doctor talking about their sexual health are very low. If the man is disabled, almost never asked about their sexual health. Think about that. Think about the impact of cancer on sexual health, by the way. The two are linked very often with this, okay? So that's good. Now, the final question, this one. Now, which comes first? Now, I'm going to do this in two stages, in a way. Which do you think should come first, okay? And then I'm going to ask you again, which actually comes first when it comes to the governments of our countries, okay? So, which should come first, okay? And let's ask the question, please. Okay, that's interesting. Got a couple of bankers in the, uh, in, the, in the room. Now then, I want to ask you, which actually comes first when it comes to the politicians in the economics and the bankers and the rest? And I want this message to go out really clear to the, to the politicians. Can we do that question again now, please? Is that possible? Can you go back to it? Don't worry if you can't. No, don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, you can. Well done. So now, which actually comes first? And we want to take this message to the politicians, okay? Right? So, which comes first? Health of our nations or money? Right. Go ahead. Is it timing? Right. Ah, sorry, I've messed you up here. I do apologize. Okay, here you go. The bankers are not allowed to vote. No votes. Actually, that's interesting. They end up the other way around. Okay. I think that actually, to me, says it all. We've got to convince them 
The health comes first, and then the economy will follow the health of our nations. We need more prevention, we need more health awareness, we need better screening programs which are targeted to people better. That's the answer I wanted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan, for this brilliant presentation. Um, I'm sure that you all have at least one question. So, can I come down? My hearing is terrible. If you are going to make a difference, there has to be a starting point. What is that starting point? Is it through literature? Is it through the women? Is it through promotion on TV? What is going to make yeah. men go to the doctor? Well, I think, first of all, we start too late. And I also pick up, you said, through women. No, no, hang on. You said through women. Why should women have to look after the health of men? Why should the elderly father, widowed, always have to rely upon the youngest daughter? She gives up her career, she gives up her relationship. Why should we? It should be equal. Men and women should look after the health of not only themselves, but of their partners and of their children. Should be educated to do so. Health education should be in the schools. It should be a compulsory part of education in our schools. And how you look after yourself, how you use your health services to your best effect, that should be compulsory. If you ask any parent what they want most for their children as they grow up, they'll say health. Money comes down here somewhere. They want to be healthy and happy. Why don't we educate them how to be healthy and happy in the schools? That's my answer. So this has to be an action with governments? Absolutely. And with the education programs. Governments and education programs. Yeah. Yeah. I love your presentation. I really love it. You're very impressed. kind, thank you. Vila Dank. Uh, my feeling is that we have to start with the earliest education yeah. because men tend never to confess anything to men and they don't involve women into their problems. So if they involve men, it's maybe in a shaggy dog story, mm. but that's all. Therefore, we have to change the gender role. Yeah. It's, it's a very good point. The, those booklets we, show you, we showed you there, they're actually designed for men to talk to other men. Because what we've found is, is once men start to do this, talk to other men about it, and it's in the, in the workplace is the big issue, or in the mosques, or anywhere where men are, football grounds, anywhere like that. If they show it to someone and start to talk about it, they're much more likely to do something about it. It's the first step to actually doing something about it, is talking to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the mates. Not necessarily a health professional, it's their mates talking to their friends. You know. I remember my son at his age of 30 asking me, well, I have a new girlfriend and my woolly is aching. Do you know a doctor for me? <laughs> yeah. uh, don't send him to me. <laughs> That is. Okay, I, many thanks. Um, I completely agree with you that um, campaigns should be focused, first of all, to the general population, but also we can run campaigns dedicated to men. It's very strange that men know better the level of their oil in their engines than their own body. I know. So, in our country, we did the action really focused on men. Yeah. And I think. Uh, we have to be some creative. Uh, but why? You, you see, you've made a really important valid point. We know that. Men, men do tend to be mechanistic. But instead of criticizing men for this, why don't we just use it to their advantage? What we tend to do is to say, you're fat, you're lazy, and you own a Y chromosome. It's all your fault. You know, instead of saying, how do men think? Well, they think that way. So use it to their advantage. Deal with what we've got instead of dreaming that they might be different. Just use them as they are now. That's, that's the question. It's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have to move to the next speaker. I'm very happy to announce uh, a real survivor, uh, Milan Jorovic from Serbia. He will tell us a wonderful story, his own story. Very simple, if we watch National Geographic or 
some of those animal kingdom stories. I don't remember that you will ever say that male is playing a weak male. He's always playing a role of the strong one, never playing a role of the weak one. So you cannot expect man to erase the code in his brain, which is a million years, so to say. Mm. So I take it more simple than just being afraid, it's just being what you're made of actually protecting the herd or whatever, so you are not allowed to show your weaknesses. And That's also right. I believe that in some period of life, uh, as you have shown to us here, uh, while they're strong and they can stand and work, they are not showing weaknesses and at the age of 60 we are going down and we are not able to produce, to protect, to bring food, so to say to hunt food, that would be money at this point. So they are coming down and then they are showing weaknesses and yeah, they should hang, okay. <laughs> but generally it is very, very, I take it very simple and I actually it's just a way to tell them we can do it secretly and you go and check it and nobody will know, I believe that they will, they will accept that if there is a confidence and so on. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, here we are. Here I'm loving and kicking as they would say in my British island and uh, people 10 years ago, it was or 11 years ago now, it was a long summer for me because I had operation and so on, but it started, let's say, 12, 13 years ago when I was finding all kinds of excuses and not showing my weaknesses to visit the doctor. Besides, I was visiting, visiting the bathroom. I had around 90 kilos. It is, let's say, 10, 15 less than now. I take myself now as okay not to sleep. And I felt sleepy all the time, and I was finding all kinds of excuses, and Mr. Excuse is the perfect, actually, for myself. So I was very inventive in all that, and uh, I was trying to avoid the colonoscopy because I knew what it is, and I knew what they would do to me there. So finally, my parents, of course, as a great support, persuade me that I should see the doctor, and I went to gastroenterologist, and... Uh, the results were not so funny like the previous presentation, but now I take it very funny and I take all those problems very easily. I was rushed to surgery and of course they never told me because I was supposed to be a young, 24 and actually to be healthy. Somehow I knew there is some big problem because the face of my father and my sister who were at the military academy where I took the examination, the colonoscopy, they were so frustrated, they, were, they looked like me, I, I, felt, I felt like that, believe me, I, but I was smiling. <laughs> Not very funny, but still it was, it was a really a bad situation. And uh, okay, I was young and I was fit to compete with that and I took it rather good and I must say I was very lucky, the position of the cancer was very low, so it was like visiting the, the garage for fixing the, you know, the ventilation of, of the car. You cut, cut the pipe and take it out and then came actually necessary chemotherapy of eight cycles and that was not so pleasant. I remember that summer was not so good for me. I could not go on the beach. But it, this time, I'm like any other person my age, I have my interests, I have my hobbies, I have my life and now, of course, I'm going regularly on checkups. I'm not making any excuses or something like that, it's just ridiculous now because in hospital you try many things, you know, many needles and all that, so now I'm not making any excuses and uh, by the time you're learning that you're not alone and there are more and more people actually, more and more young, unfortunately, those which are supposed to hunt food and protect the women and so on. And the worst
first thing is that you're learning each day that colorectal cancer doesn't choose you at all. You have so random choice that it's a disaster. There is a Matilda story and uh, this young lady at age 31, you can say she was older than me, but the position when you're planning, you are having completely other plans, like having a family and having her first baby, and then you find out that you have colorectal cancer. I thought, okay, I was young and that is bad, but being young and pregnant and having found out that you have colorectal cancer and that is more than bad. You're not smiling at all now, yes, I know. The previous was much nicer in playing with psychology, but this is the something that brings you to the real issue of the colorectal cancer. When she was four months pregnant, she had those symptoms and uh, she insisted on doing the scan and she has found out that she has colorectal cancer and in 20 weeks of pregnancy she had a very, very unpleasant decision keeping the baby or go for chemotherapy and she decided to start with chemotherapy and this June 2013 she brought a baby, a baby boy. So to be happy, not to be happy, you know, those emotions uh, yesterday we saw the metro of uh, Tokyo. I believe that three of those metros are in hand and thinking so many uh, bad things. But generally, the birth of a baby is more pleasant emotion than anything else. She also, during that time, made some illustrations of her life and it was rather interesting and when I saw her pictures I also remembered my time when I was in the hospital and it was almost the same, just the other article so to say or she had a t-shirt which she had on her when they told her that she's having the colorectal cancer and of course she's not wearing I had a bathrobe in the hospital very nice, very good but I don't know where it is and I don't care now, believe me, because it all brings you bad memories. Also, the surroundings is something that you need and is it at the beginning sending you SMS or emails of support, at that time the worst thing is to be left alone. And uh, when people actually don't know what to say, they just tell you be strong and you're the fighter and so on, but still uh, sometimes you go mad and you don't know what to do when you are actually in the worst, the worst position that you can imagine, especially when you're pregnant. And Matilda was in that position. As you can read here, you're the greatest, love you so much. So those are the messages that you receive from family and everybody else. And as well, you can read the other one. I cannot. It's just too much you know, to read and to recollect the old memories. No food, but still they are bringing you some plastic food. Visiting, and you're actually after the operation. I was trying to talk all day, but just not possible without the belly. <laughs> and some of those which are actually, you know, sometimes you have to give yourself a relief allow yourself and nobody will actually you see maybe it's rude to have some, such a note on the screen but still in those positions then you you just have to take it out of yourself so since there is a, too many young people which are actually affected by colorectal cancer 
we are not able actually to communicate too much because none of us is thinking about that, none of us is going to check what, what's new about that because you are young and healthy, having your hobbies, having your life, nightlife and uh, actually Young Voices United is organized to help those affected by CRC and also those who are having someone in family affected by CRC and to raise awareness about colorectal cancer in young adults and to create an empowered community just to make good prevention and at this age if you cannot think about mortality you're just thinking about prevention good luck lifestyle and uh, bringing more people to their own body to listen to their body and to listen to their needs because trust me body tells you the best if something is wrong with you it's, there is always a reaction so you just be cautious and listen to your body we're having also three questions and I suppose I'm not in charge so the first question do you think that all cancer survivors have the same opportunity to find a job. Simple as that. Yes or no? Mm. Expected. It is very simple. Yesterday we had some discussions, so it was rather obvious that people are not having, depending on the condition and everything, but there are marks, so to say. Next question, please. Do you think that governments should do more on education citizens on cancer issues, especially healthy lifestyle and cancer prevention? Does anybody has an answer and why they are not? <laughs> I take it I take it very seriously because I know the effects, for example, for me, for Matilda, I think it's the same for everyone. The effect is very simple. I was not the only one affected by colorectal cancer. I have a sister, I have a father, I have a mother. They're affected. They're not productive on their jobs at that time. At all, trust me, they're completely lost. They don't even know how to put down the blanket, you know, and to make it smaller, to make a double pillow. So I think it's the big, biggest loss is not to give money on prevention and uh, cancer prevention, but to lose the bees actually in the, in the country. Next question, please. Do you think that general practitioners or family doctors should be more educated on cancer? Indeed. Yes? No. Ninety-six four, yes, uh, definitely. I would say that it, it, sh it should be hundred. I'm interested who is four percent. <laughs> who is the person? <laughs> Same person. <laughs> <laughs> He's a doctor. Well, uh, <laughs> a few weeks ago, uh, from the, so to say, next to our equestrian club, some girl came and she said, you know, I heard that you had a problem. I said, yes. You know, my mother has a problem like that. And where are you from? I said, she said, from some city in, Bel in uh, Serbia. And I said, okay. And while well, she's visiting uh, her doctor, she's visiting some gastroenterologist. And she went to colonoscopy, I don't know how many times, and nothing. I said, it cannot be nothing, you know. She doesn't have anything in her colon, everything is clear, yes, and? Well, she's having pains, she's uh, sometimes blood in the, in 
and nothing. They found nothing with the nose. Yes, okay, I will check which are the doctors there and then I will get back to you. And the situation was very simple. Doctors from Galway said uh, she should go 30 kilometers from her place to visit this doctor because he is the good man. And what about that? They are doctors and they don't know much. So, what is the, our point to connect people to the right doctors at the end? And unfortunately, doctors are indefinitely lack of knowledge. And general practitioners also should have at least courage to send immediately to colonoscopy. <laughs> because there is no other way actually to, to be certain that everything is okay. I believe that is the last question. Any more questions? Besides these three questions? <laughs> There's a question. Thank you, Milan, for a very impressive story, I must say. Um, did I get you right that um, there were cases of cancer in your family? No. There were no cases. No, That's why just heart attack and brain attack, nothing right. else. Right, so the question that I have for you is, I know you've, you've started um, this wonderful initiative um, for young critical cancer patients. Um, have you bumped into young people who have had a positive family history, or are there not enough around yet? Do you have any idea if... if you are also targeting like families? Uh, actually, the, there are more young people who are asking about their parents and not asking about themselves. Right. And the other question I have at this point, what is the age group of the people that are, that are responding? 30 plus. 30 plus. Okay, not younger than 30. No. Okay, the youngest person that actually told a friend of mine told about her friend and calling me that it has some symptoms it he was 30. Well, I think it's desperate need for what you're doing. I wish you a lot of good luck. Thank you. I think the thing we need now sorry, is to um, we have to go back to the whole thing people don't want to talk about it. And I think one of the things that as an organization we have to do, especially after you said about the way the young male, you know, is the lion. And so I think we need to do something very innovative to try and make the website more prominent. And I think Luke is a classic example who has a website and he's got thousands and thousands of hits. I don't know whether it's Facebooking more, tweeting more. Maybe this would be something you'd like to talk about because we have to do something to get to these young lions who will not speak. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> well, thanks again. I think it was a really most uplifting presentation. What I like about the optimism. Well, the the as well. <laughs> but can I just say? Um, Yola and I sit in the same committee for the um, European Cancer Organization, ECHO, and in the Amsterdam conference, which is a huge conference, there is a track about young uh, people and, and, and cancer, and I would strongly recommend people who are, are interested in this area to attend for this. And the reason why I say that is, is that even in the cancer fraternity, the cancer family, um, I mean just people who are aware of, of cancer more than others, there is still a very low understanding of how colorectal cancer can affect young people. And it is seen still as an older person's um, problem. And, and if that's true, even within the cancer people, then it's even worse than in the general population. So it might be worth thinking about that conference. Thank you. Just in reaction to Jan's uh, proposition to go to Amsterdam. Jan? I don't know if you know, there is a barrier for patients to go to Amsterdam because they're asking 150 euro even for patient advocates to go there. And I think that is not tolerable, even if they sponsor your presence with 250. We have to do something about that. Well, 
It is? There is a full cover. You can get full cover. Okay. So it's worth, and I think it's still open for, okay. for that. But I do agree with you, and I'm going to say that in the board meeting. I sit on the board, and I'm yeah. going to say what you've just said to me yeah. in the board. Cause that was not the case in Stockholm no, last time. You're absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. You read a comment in the back? That pisses me off. Going on from the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch are um, pre presenting the last day for the public. Um, the Dutch people can go to, the, to Amsterdam and they can uh, they get a, 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 a story about what happened in uh, the Echo. Because indeed, it's I want it to go, but it's much too expensive for normal people. And of course I can get funds, but I think that's not good. And I think if, if, um, if you will do this to the board of ECHO, um, perhaps the next time they will um, give access for patients also.
look common to continue and with his presentation. And I'm very honored to announce the election. Well, when I saw the program, I know it would be very, very difficult to give uh, my presentation after all these brilliant presentations, but I'm trying to do my best. Where do you begin in colorectal cancer prevention? If you speak about colorectal pre uh, cancer prevention, we know there are three different levels. There's a primary level, there's a secondary level, and a tertiary level. The secondary level is all about screening. The tertiary level is about diagnosis and treatment and surveillance. I won't speak about it, no problem. Today I will speak about primary prevention. Primary prevention, that's the reduction of the risk factors before the occurrence of colorectal cancer. In other words, is stop colon cancer before it starts. That's the definition of primary prevention. That's what I'm trying to do with my foundation, my youngsters, stop diagnosis cancer, stop colon cancer, which we started a few years ago. What is the risk of colorectal cancer? I'm sure that all of you know that it's 5%, one out of 20. But it means also, if you look at it in a positive way, that you have 90 chances out of 20 not to have colon cancer. But you have to know what to do. Can we reduce the risk of colorectal cancer? The question is, can we reduce this 5% risk? And the answer is simple. Yes, we can, but we have a problem. We don't do it enough. Americans and everyone in the world can prevent one-third of the most common cancer. Data from the American Cancer Research Society, for instance, breast cancer, look to this data. 38% of the breast cancers could be avoided. And look for colorectal cancer, 50% of the cases, every one out of two cancers can be prevented by a healthy lifestyle. Why don't we do it? For those who are really interested, these two guys wrote a brilliant report in gastroenterology three years ago about the primary prevention of colorectal cancer. And they have a very nice, quite complicated slide that I will show you. We know now that obesity, aspirin, vitamin D, through the pathway of the prostaglandins, can have influences on these proteins, the b catenin EGFR, cyclins, this can lead to decreased immunity, increased proliferation, migration, apoptosis, and we heard a lot yesterday about angiogenesis. We know, we as some scientists know these pathways. And if we look in this program, is this article, there are three different chapters. There's the diet, there's the lifestyle, and there's the medication. What about the diet? We all know that fruit, vegetables, fiber, calcium, vitamin D can have a positive effect on the prevention of colorectal cancer. Antioxidants, micronutrients, this, every week there's some, an article that is saying this or this can prevent colon cancer. It's a lot of different factors. What about the lifestyle? The lifestyle, alcohol. Too much alcohol is not good, too much smoking is not good and body mass and fat distribution. I'm sure that you know that overweight is a risk factor for colorectal cancer. There is the aspirin story. We could organize a whole symposium about the role of aspirin. NSAIDs, COX inhibition, and some postmenopausal hormones can also contribute and have a positive effect on the prevention of colorectal cancer. A very nice prospective study was done in Denmark. And the Danish cohort study for more than 50,000 people, they looked what happens if people can adhere to some lifestyle recommendations. And they took the five different factors I was talking about. Smoking, alcohol, physical activity, waist circumference, overweight, and diet. And they made a lifestyle index score. And what they showed is that the more people could adhere to these five different factors, if you could avoid overweight, you could avoid excess drinking, if you could avoid smoking, regular exercise, then your risk of colon cancer was decreased by 25%. A healthy lifestyle can result in this. It's very simple. 
a healthy lifestyle can give a 25% reduction of colorectal cancer cases. I'm sure yesterday night we had a very nice dinner. I was on the left side, but I will do it only one day. And I'm sure that you know that excess of red meat is not good for colorectal cancer. And also here we have this wonderful slide from the same uh, uh, article. We know what cured meat and red meat, what it does, it can have some nitrosation, nitrosylation, fat peroxidation, it can give some DNA damage, DNA uh, abnormalities, and this will start a normal crib, a normal cell. This can lead in the event from an adenoma and a carcinoma. This is a very complex thing, but these are things we know nowadays. And I'm sure that for those who had breakfast this morning, I took this one. This is better, this is more colorful, and it's also better for your colon cancer prevention. Stop colon cancer before it starts. But when does it start? When does it start? When are the first abnormalities in our body leading to colon cancer? It might look a little bit complicated, but I will take you through. If we start here on the left lower corner, where nothing happens, then we have a microadenoma, a small adenoma, a large adenoma, early carcinoma, advanced carcinoma, and if we look to the axis and we increase it, then we see that initially it's six years, and then it takes 17 years from a small adenoma to the metastasis. And the answer is quite simple. When does it start? More than 25 years ago. Not 5 years ago, not 10 years ago, but 25 years ago. So that's for I you. I was 24, so... It's when you were. <laughs> and I, my last slide will be the proof of that. So, who should we focus on? We should focus on the younger generation, the under 18s, those who go to school, and the younger people, the 1832, the so-called Y generation, the Z generation, we should focus on our message to this generation. But we have a problem. There is a new disease, a new disease called infobesity. These young people are overloaded. They have not only an overweight, but through all the social media, they got so much information that in the end of the day, they fell asleep behind the computer and they don't work anymore. And their head is nearly bursting from all these messages they get through their uh, social media. And we have to put in the message from a healthy lifestyle. So it's going to be a quite tough thing to do. And it can be very simple. Five steps to a healthy lifestyle. Get active for an hour or more each day. Choose water as a drink, what I was doing. Eat more fruit and vegetables, my breakfast this morning. Turn off the TV or computer and get active. Eat fewer snacks and select healthier alternatives. It seems simple, it looks simple, but we have really to keep the message simple. If we use the social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, we should say, okay, you can reduce your risk by healthy eating, exercise daily, no smoking, and for the parents, or if they're younger, regular screening. That's what I did a few uh, weeks ago to, to, uh, during the Colon Cancer Awareness Month. I went to an elementary school and I had got 10 minutes during the um, break at mid, uh, the midday and I could explain to these teachers why we should do an action in an elementary school about colon cancer. So we said let's organize a contest, a drawing contest about healthy lifestyle. And here are the results. You see, this guy made a logo, he said, well, healthy exercise, this one was no smoking, this was no alcohol, no overweight, healthy food, and it was a very nice exposition of these drawings, healthy lifestyle. And in the evening when the parents came, they showed these uh, things and we get brochures about colorectal cancer. So the youngsters were teaching their parents. I really hope that these young people, this girl, 15 years old, who did a hip-hop action for our uh, foundation, and these players from the second division of my uh, hometown, Antwerp, 
when they have my age, they will live in a world where colon cancer is a rare disease. And we're trying to give information. This is a Facebook page a few days ago. I really believe that more information will lead to less colon cancer. I'm giving a lot of presentations. And as you see, we have now more than 20,000 people who follow us on Facebook. And I'm putting nearly every day messages, information about colon cancer, what you can do, how you can prevent. And we share also things from the younger groups from Milan's organization. What I made a few months ago, we made a, a lesson about colon cancer. This is a school board that we made on the computer, one out of 20. It's 9% older than 50 years, but that means, and Milan knows it, that 10% of the people are younger than 50 years. The blue ribbon, the cases in Belgium, the risk factors, the story from the polyp until cancer, 20% familiar, 80% non-familiar, the simple FOBT test, the polyps, and look here, this is breast cancer, and this is bowel cancer, this is AIDS, and this is the car accidents. Breast cancer is getting a lot of attention in the media, and Angelina Jolie did a wonderful job, we can't say anything about it. But look at bowel cancer, bowel cancer should have the main, the same attention in the media. And that's what we are trying to do. This is available. We have now a French. We made a French one. And it's very easy to translate this in English. And if you want, you just mail me and I will send you the feedback file. Everyone knows the Live Strong organization. And Live Strong is doing wonderful work. But probably we should organize or create a new organization. And I would call it Live Healthy. Live Healthy, since by that way, we really can prevent colon cancer. When we decide to do something to help mankind, we take the first step in the right direction. When we educate others in the right steps to take, we create a mass of people that can change the world. And that's what we should do. Where do you begin in colorectal cancer prevention, Milan? I really don't know. I don't have the answer, but I think the answer is this probably as early as possible. Stop colon cancer. Thank you for your attention. I also have some questions. What's, well, okay. What's, according to you, the most important risk factor in your opinion? The scientists don't know it, but I'm asking it to you. Is it smoking? Is it alcohol? Is it unhealthy food? Is it probably overweight? Or is it the lack of exercise? You can vote from now on, I think. Well, um, I agree that we should pay more attention not to junk food, but to healthy food, and that overweight is really an important risk factor. People like uh, alcohol, I think, and uh, we should go more to the fitness rooms. The second question, does an aspirin a day keep the colon cancer away? What's your opinion? Do you think yes, do you think no, or you don't know? We could organize a two-day symposium about this, but one question, voting now. Interesting, one third of the people believe it is, one third we have to convince that some studies are indicating, and one third, okay, it's correct, I don't know. I think you can summarize it in three things. There are studies showing that if you take low-dose aspirin for many, many years, and at least five years, then it can give a small reduction in the risk of colon cancer. That's one thing. Second thing, in some familiar syndromes, the AHPCC, hereditary non polyposis colon cancer syndrome, the Lynch syndrome, if these people take aspirin, it seems that their risk to get colon cancer can decrease. Last thing, very interesting, few studies showing that people who had colon cancer 
and they survived and they had their operation, their chemotherapy, if they take aspirin, then it seems there is a reduction in the recurrence of colon cancer. So there is a very interesting role for aspirin. Last question. At what age should children be taught about a healthy lifestyle for cancer prevention? Should we go to the very young ones, or to the 10, 12 years, or to the high school, 13, 15 years, 16 to 18 years? Oh, I see that somebody added one possibility, all of the above. Five seconds left. And here are the results. Well, I think that all agree. I also agree that I should, we should focus on this young generation and we should really try to, to be creative and to do actions about this health promotion, a healthy lifestyle in childhood. This was my last question. Are there questions from the audience? One of the biggest questions I have is how do you move children from behind their computers? School grounds are closing because they're selling land to make money. Kids are not getting exercise. Parents find it a good solution because it keeps them quiet. How do you influence it? Because I, I have no idea how to start. Well, I think um, the school has a, a very important role in this. Uh, I think that if the school would decide that uh, one day a year they would pay attention to, to general uh, healthy, to health, and to healthy food and other actions, so that they are um, that they sh should listen to what the teachers are saying. That should be just one step. The other thing is that we should also approach them using their media and they grow up with the social media so we should use Facebook, you should Twitter, we should make nice YouTube films, we should make, why not make a nice game hunting or looking for the polyp and this is something I've had these about but um, and they will like instead of playing on the PlayStation and hunting for I don't know what, they can also hunt for polyps and uh, Well, the battle against colon cancer, you already know it, it's, uh, it's a battle that we have to, to lead at, at least for the next uh, 25 years. And uh, we have to keep pushing, 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 pushing every day. It's, uh, it's not easy. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I want to ask how, what do you think, how the uh, very strong stress influence to uh, cancer? Because there are a lot of talking about these uh, newspapers. I think, well, I think for, serious, probably there might be a role. Um, and one of the things that's very difficult to measure stress. Uh, how do you measure stress? Stress for one person is probably not stress for another one. Uh, as a gastroenterologist, I know that, for instance, in inflammatory bowel disease, uh, there is quite a very nice relation between those pe people who have. Uh, ulcerative colitis, if they have stress, then the risk to have a flare-up exists. Uh, to say that stress can lead to colon cancer, I think that's too early and we don't have data to, uh, to show that. But also healthy food is difficult to measure uh, because uh, people don't know what healthy food is. Because uh, most of food is processed. Nowadays, so how, uh, I agree with you. It's, be experts to, to know <laughs> it's, it's, it's very complex, uh, but um, we should work on that and we should try to convince them that, uh, that there's a way of eating, a way of living that can be healthy for the future. Um, congratulations on the very interesting uh, presentations. And, um, uh, from our experience in Cyprus, we have been doing a lot of work with uh, starting from kindergartens actually and doing presentations uh, theatrically, etc. 
training teachers and uh, even the, the children themselves getting involved in this. But I think as Yola uh, mentioned, uh, these have their um, uh, life expectancy in a way. Uh, and I feel for something to be long-staying, we need to um, actively pressurize the governments to take policies. For example, we saw this um, with the Ministry of Education uh, and the Ministry in projection with the Ministry of uh, Agriculture um, implementing a pilot um, a project uh, where they offered fruit and vegetable once a week uh, to schools. And this has made a tremendous difference. So policies uh, on what uh, is done in the schools uh, every day. For example, the time being spent on exercise, on physical education, has been reduced. We need to put that back into its right perspective. Um, academics uh, and all that is important, but what's the point when you don't have your health? So, uh, in order for these two to be uh, in balance, they need to be in the curriculum, and uh, everybody needs to be more creative in order to draw children away from the um, computers. But definitely, who wouldn't like a, a game of uh, volleyball during the, the break, or basketball, or something? Uh, I think once the children are given the opportunity uh, to have hikes, to go uh, on bicycle rides, provided, again, you have the facilities for, the, for that uh, to be done in uh, um, a safe uh, manner, uh, I think children will go for it. Uh, we see that children are like uh, sponges. Uh, once things are given to them in a nice uh, and um, hopeful way, uh, they take it on. And then they go home. And at yeah. home they may not find the food and vegetables on the table. And they find the croissants or something. What's, well, interesting, what's interesting, what we did, uh, what the school organized, I didn't ask for it, but what the school organized when they did this drawing contest, they started in the morning with a healthy breakfast um, and they had it uh, outside on the, the playground and they did, uh, instead of starting at 9.30, at 9, they started at 9.30 since they did uh, half an hour of uh, gymnastics and they were all dressed in blue and that was very nice. I think um, uh, for the, the blood in the stool, I know the, there's a Dutch company who made a very nice tool, <laughs> they call it a fico tainer, and uh, you can find it on the web, which will cost uh, less than five euros since it's from plastic, and you can hang it in your closet, so that will help you to collect what you have to collect. Uh, on the other hand, I'm sure that if we are here again within two, and I'm sure within four years, that we probably will have other tests and we will moving to blood tests, some data, urine tests and what is very promising is breath tests. There are some initial studies from breath tests and I'm sure if we can make this true and if this works then the participation rate will, uh, will grow since everyone will be very happy instead of alcohol control to do a breath test for colon cancer. Okay, other questions? Otherwise we move to I would to just the like to make a comment on this. It's, for me it's a very funny issue, but still it's very serious. And on the other hand, if you have, have to go to buy that, so to say, on purpose, you're suspicious and you go on purpose and buy something for that intention, then uh, somebody will look at you strange and you don't want to be looked like that. But if you buy it just because you think that someday you will need it, while, let's say while you are 30, then maybe I will need it at 50, nobody will look at you. You're just buying a toilet, what? never mind. But the, mod the model is very specific, you know. And by now nobody is thinking that it is because of that. Just people like it. 
Okay, then I think we finish this session and I ask the other people to come forward.